spoiler alert. Please be advised that the following video will contain spoilers for Lovecraft Country. What's up everybody, it's me E-Man from E-Man's Movie Reviews. Welcome back to one and all of you who have been on this long journey with me ever since episode one. And welcome to any of you that might be stumbling upon my channel for the very first time. Well, we have finally made it. We are at the season finale of Lovecraft Country, and it looks like we're going back to basics. We don't have like the crazy horror or sci-fi stuff that's going on. It looks like we're going right back to just straight up magic. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to cover and a lot of things we got to talk about. So let's go over the episode. After bringing back the Book of Names from their time travel adventures, the family is still fighting to help Dee fight off this curse. Keep in mind that the spell Christina placed on her was only to buy them some extra time by resetting the cycle of the curse. Tick starts reading the passage to open the Book of Names, and the book flips right open to the page with a symbol that resembles Tick's family birthmark. Moments later, both Tick and Letty pass out, and they're immediately transferred to a different realm where they are able to talk to their ancestors. Yo, I'm like, yo, finally. Hannah has learned how to unmute herself and finally just speak. But I gotta say, this entire scene with all the fire and everything going on, it kind of reminded me of like Nightmare on Elm Street or something like that. Letty is back in the same house that she escaped from during the Tulsa Massacre, and this time she's met by Tick's great-grandmother, Hattie. Hattie lets her know that she's safe and that it's time for both her and Tick to learn some magic. Now, in case anyone missed it, Keep in mind that this whole burning space or whatever, this was made by Hannah as a safe place for her family. So if you were wondering why Letty was able to come in, it was because of the baby that Letty is carrying. So because Letty's connected to the baby, she kind of got like a free invite to also be in this safe space for Tick's family. That's why Hattie said, the one you carry brought you here. Hannah explains to Tick that while she escaped, she knew that her child would always be found and seen as a source of power for the men in the cult order. So she made a spell that Titus used on himself that would hide their entire bloodline from others who knew magic. That spell is where the family birthmark derives from. Turns out that this ancestral space was created by Hannah the night she opened the Book of Names. She thought it was hell at first with all the flames, but rather the flames were just manifested from her rage. Once she learned how to control it, she made it a safe place for her family. That, to me, was pretty deep. This show continues to highlight the theme of the strength of black women. Consider the fact that Hannah was an enslaved African American who was raped and abused, and that in itself is an unimaginable amount of mental and emotional trauma to face. Then the moment she opened up the book of names, she also created an entire realm of fire, which she interpreted as hell for some punishment. But before she eventually was driven to the point of suicide, this woman still came up with a spell to protect her entire family, change this hellish realm into a safe place for her family, and work out a final knockout spell to protect everyone from the evils she's faced. I mean, literally, when you think of like the courage and the strength it takes to be mindful of those that are coming after you in the midst of your own pain and suffering and trauma, that to me is unbelievable. And now we also see where Hattie got all her strength from because she did the very same thing when she let herself burn alive to save future generations. I mean, look, black women have been the true MVPs and it's not even close. Yo, I know this part of the story is all fictional and everything, but like, I'm just kind of thinking of when people say we are not our ancestors. And after seeing stuff like this of like how ancestors would literally die for the future generation, I don't know, that saying kind of hits a little different. Tick is transported to his family home as Billie Holiday's song, Easy Living, plays on the record player. As the door opens, Tick is reunited with his mother, Dora. He lays his head in her lap, and she comforts him, given the tremendous task that has been placed on him by Hannah. Tick wants to find another way to stop Christina without that heavy price, and Dora said that there isn't always another choice. She said that she didn't have a choice with George and Montrose, and they were both a part of her soul, and all their love made Tick. Yeah, they had an entanglement. She encourages him and tells him that Hannah's spell is going to change everything. 
It's a beginning and not an end. We go back to Hattie teaching Letty some magic. And it looks like Tick is now ready. They focus and start chanting around the bed from the other realm. They successfully return Dee back to normal. However, the spell forgot to fully exfoliate and moisturize Dee's left arm, leaving it still in bad condition. Letty immediately starts writing down everything that she learned from Hattie about Hannah's spell. It appears as though Hannah's spell is a binding spell that will require a physical connection between Titus Braithwaite tick and christina in order to work montrose tries to persuade tick against going through with this ceremony but tick is dead set on using the book of names to protect their entire family before tick and letty set out we see tick pause for a moment to check on the black shaga yo you know what i was actually wondering what happened to the black shaga you know what i actually really want to give this shaga like a nickname or something because you know he is a bad mother shut your mouth i can dig it I mean, look, ever since he chewed up them police officers, it looks like he's been chilling in Letty's basement all this time. Now, I still wonder, how exactly did all those police bodies that were murdered in front of a black household just magically disappear and nobody said anything about it? Like, there was no follow-up? Who cleaned up the bodies? Oh, we gonna skip that too? Oh, okay. As Tick and Letty head back to the underground area below the museum, they begin to prepare the area to cast a spell. They recite the incantations and summon the head racist in charge himself, Titus Braithwaite. Titus is notably shocked that black people can read and wonders who has conjured him up. Hannah pops up and she's like, surprise, Marasaka. Despite Hannah showing up, Titus is able to escape. He reappears in the middle of the street, causing Christina and Ruby's car to crash. Christina goes flying through the window like a crash test dummy, but she's fine because she's got the mark of Cain. Titus tried to snitch on Letty and Tick, but the ancestor said, ah, ah, ah. Now surrounded by Letty, Hattie, Hannah, and Dora, Titus has been summoned back to the circle. This gives Tick the opportunity to shank Titus and rip out a piece of his flesh. They then bid farewell to the ancestors and release them. First of all, this was gross. Second of all, this spell was so petty. Imagine this, you a whole racist, minding your business in hell. Just to be brought back to the world, to die again, get a piece of your body cut out by a black man, and then go right back to hell. <laughs> I'm okay with this. We go back to Dee and Hippolyta, and Dee's still mad with her mother for leaving her alone for so long. Hippolyta said that she went away to become the heroine that Dee always imagined her to be. While Hippolyta was there, she named herself Mother and she told Dee that she would have always came back to her. Dee cut her off and said that she didn't care what Hippolyta would have done. Dee reiterates the point that she was completely alone. Okay, false alarm. Um, I mean, look, for real though, we've gone over this already. Uh, you know, after everything that Dee has been through, um, you know, she was left completely alone. And even though they were able to save her life and everything, um, she was still left with that walking dead arm. So I totally understand for her to feel the way that she does. But I do have a question for you all. On one hand, we have Hippolyta who's been shrinking her whole life, so some time to really discover herself was definitely necessary. On the other hand, you are a mom and you have a child that you're responsible for too. So my question for you is, do you think Dee was being a little too selfish with her adventures? Let me know what you think. Meanwhile, Letty, Tick, and Montrose are trying to plan their next steps to complete Hannah's spell. They need a piece of Christina's body in order to finish it. Recall that they need the pieces of all three bodies to be connected in order for the spell to be complete. Letty says that Ruby can help them get to Christina. Speaking of which, Christina barges right into the store to talk to Tick. She wanted to explain that this wasn't personal or generational hate. Tick's death as a sacrifice is just a consequence of the spell. She knows that they have the book of names, so she tells them to give it to her. If they do, she says that she'll find another way to do her spell without involving Tick, and she'll also leave his family alone. Atticus declines and Christina walks out angry and removes the invulnerability spell from Letty. Now, I gotta admit, I think I would have given Christina's offer some serious consideration. I mean, help me out here. Has she really lied, though? 
Like, she's been helping them quite a lot. I mean, she helped Letty with the invulnerability. She helped Diana. Um, She's helped Ruby. You know, like, she's been helping folks. And I do kind of wonder, like, I don't know. Maybe if she had the book of names, maybe she could find a different way to have her little, you know, immortal spell or whatever. I mean, I know she's supposed to be the villain and everything, but in a weird way, she does also tend to keep her word. So do you think that they should have given her the book of names or maybe even like pictures of it? We head back to Letty's house and hold up. Are those black neighbors? Well, as you can recall back in episode three, the white racist neighbors who were harassing the black residents have apparently moved away. This could be the beginnings of the term white flight, which is basically the phenomenon that involved white residents moving away from areas that black people also resided in. The white residents usually would move to more affluent areas such as the suburbs and much later on would adopt laws or policies such as redlining. For those unfamiliar, redlining was the formerly legal practice of when banks would discriminate against black people for housing opportunities. The banks would then take literally a red marker and outline areas in a city or community where black people could or could not live. I'd also like to point out the difference and similarity between the race massacre we previously saw and redlining. The race massacres were just a violent manifestation of racism, but redlining, white flight, and banking discrimination were just less bloody. However, both carried the similar impact of suppressing the ability for black people to obtain the economic opportunities and financial boost that home ownership provides. Redlining policies officially ended only 50 some odd years ago. However, some fair housing policies that were in place to prevent racial biases like redlining are being rolled back and even undone to this very day. Back to the episode, Tick gets on the phone and we see that he's setting up a meeting with Gia. Tick admits that what they had in Korea was indeed real love. He apologizes to her for what he said the last time they met. He admits that he tried to deny their love as a way to deny all the weird stuff that happened between them. Gia's mother has also died, and she's afraid of not being able to feel. However, Tick lets her know that their connection makes them family. First of all, I'm glad that Tick apologized, because he was out here looking like Mr. from The Color Purple. Now, the apology was a little boo-boo, but you know what? At least he still did it. But one other thing. This woman goes and flies across the entire world to save your life, and Tick goes and put her, not in the friend zone, But the family zone? Knowing full well that she still loves you? Tick, man, you a piece of work, dog. Ruby and Letty meet up at their mother's grave. Letty confesses that she missed their mother's funeral because she was in jail at the time. She continues to tell Letty her definition of family and how it's a willingness to sacrifice everything that's necessary to protect it. She then reveals to Ruby that with the Book of Names, they will use it to bind Christina, but they need Ruby's help to get a part of Christina's body to finish the spell. Ruby admits that Letty's definition of family is flawed because she believes that Letty only uses the family card when it's convenient or when Letty wants something. You know, I really like these, you know, sister-sister talks and everything because I think it sheds some real light on these characters. I mean, I think at this point in the story, Letty is showing some real growth and maturation, especially from the girl that we saw, like, ever since, you know, in episode one. I mean, after talking to the ancestors and living through and witnessing the sacrifices that they were willing to make, Letty does have a new firm understanding of what family really means. On the flip side... Ruby isn't wrong about Letty here either. I mean, she said that Letty only comes around whenever she needs something. And well, that's exactly what's happening right now. Letty does need Ruby's help. And she is pulling that family card. So I can't blame Ruby for being a little skeptical, even if Letty is talking some real good game right now. We jump back to find D scratching out the faces of Emmett Till's murderers. As you may recall from my previous video, I mentioned that the murderers of Emmett Till were never convicted. Well, here's a little bit more information as to why, weeks after the murder, this is still making headlines in the story. On September 19th, the kidnapping and murder trial of Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam began in Sumner, Mississippi. Only five days later, an all-white, all-male jury acquitted the two men of murder after deliberating for only about an hour or so. The jury even said that despite all the overwhelming evidence that the defendants were guilty, 
they would have come to a quicker decision had they not had a soda break. The egregious acquittal made international news and sparked international outrage, all of which helped to ignite the American civil rights movement. Just a few months after the acquittal, both Bryant and Millam were interviewed in Look Magazine in the article titled The Shocking Story of Approved Killing in Mississippi. The two men provided graphic detail in how they beat, shot, and disposed of Emmett Till's body. The two murderers were then paid $4,000 for their participation, which roughly translates to about $38,000 apiece in today's terms. Both murderers were never brought to justice, and both later died of cancer. So, we have gone from slavery, race massacres, to Jim Crow, police brutality, housing discrimination, judicial injustice, and we haven't even gotten to voting or educational discrimination. All those things work hand in hand, changing and evolving over time. And just like that, this show has given you a small sample size and just a quick look at what institutional systemic racism looks like. And for all the deniers of systemic racism, just like the coronavirus, I'm telling you, shit is real! As Dee continues to scratch out the newspaper, a comic book slides under her door. Did anyone else think that that was a ghost for a quick second? I mean, we've seen what happens the last time books start moving on their own and dropping in all this stuff. Look, I'm just saying, I would have been out that window. Thankfully, the comic book wasn't moving because of some creepy BET Halloween special ghost, and instead it was Hippolyta. Turns out that Hippolyta drew that comic book after an artist named Afuya taught her. Fun fact, Hippolyta is referring to Afuya Richardson, who is a real-life artist and actually drew that comic book that you see in the show. You can follow her to see more of her dope artwork here. Diana is still sad because she knows she can't draw anymore with her Crypt Keeper arm. Hippolyta says that time is in our minds and that in time everything will be all right. She also reassures Diana that she will make sure that Diana will be able to draw again. Dee is brought into a room where we hear a bunch of machines whirring about. Well, clearly with all this like gathered up knowledge and wisdom and all this stuff that Hippolyta has gained, you know, in her travels, uh, it seems like she's got like a science lab or something in her room. And I think it's pretty obvious at this point that, um, you know, D is going to get like some sort of robotic prosthetic arm uh, from Hippolyta. And this also feeds into the theory that a number of you already had, which is D is probably also that woman in the future that had that robot arm and gave Tick that Lovecraft book. Which, by the way, creates a really strange time paradox because Tick got it from her future self, but her future self got it from Tick in the past. And not, yeah, you just got a weird time paradox. Meanwhile, Christina is going over the details of her spell, and she begins to explain to Ruby the fundamental elements of magic. So in order for Christina to meet the combined body requirement within that body transformation spell, she's had to use parts of her own body, like her hair and blood and nails, along with William's body. This is also why she's kept William's body in a comatose state, so that she'll always have access to it to keep reproducing the blood transformation spell. Christina also says that one can amplify the elements in a magic spell to have a bigger impact. Ruby assures Christina that her spell is going to work and she'll be there to support her. Then they share their first kiss with no magic involved. We jump over to Tick who is looking pretty nervous as he sits in church getting ready to be baptized with Letty. Tick is primarily here due to Letty's urging and while he might be doubtful, she does believe that God is going to look after them. She said that all this time she's been chasing her faith rather than discovering the faith that's within her. She believes that that's where God resides inside of her and inside of all of them. And she sees that in both Tick and in their baby. Ooh, hey, yo, Letty was out here preaching that word. Well, looks like everyone's packed up and ready to go back to Artem. Ruby calls out to Letty before they head out and hands her Christina's blood potion. Not only that, but she also hops in the car with them and everyone starts to sing along during their road trip. Aw, look at the sisters playing nice and everything. I love to see it. That's nice. 
And you know what? Yo, it looked like Ruby was a true hustler, just like her mother. And I was really glad to see that Ruby had came around because I was really worried that we wouldn't be able to trust her. Man, I guess they were not playing around talking about Woody could fit half of Chicago inside of there. But yet, we see everybody singing along, having a good old time. Even Poopy Face Montrose is getting in on the fun and songs too. But we all know this show is not about to let no minorities have fun for too long. As they head back to Arda, Montrose begins to lay out a trail of salt to prepare for the spell. Tick prepares by eating a piece of Titus' body and drinking Christina's blood. Ooh, bruh, bruh, you wanna just use a little, I mean, come, I mean, Montrose got a whole bunch of salt right there. I mean, you could have sauteed that thing up a little bit of something, ugh. Tick shows up for the ritual, and all these white servants show up out of nowhere, apparently after playing hide-and-seek all night. Meanwhile, Letty and Ruby are prepping the spells nearby. Ruby says that she enjoyed the trip to Artem. She feels like she understands the pull of family for the first time. That's when Letty realizes that something is off. Ruby says that she caught Ruby trying to steal the potion for Letty, and that it's Letty's fault that Ruby is now dead, thus revealing that Ruby is actually Christina in disguise. Yo, didn't see that coming. Did you? I mean, this clearly was the best twist in the entire episode. And you know what? Look, in my previous uh, video, I did mention that I had the, I did believe that the body transformation potion was gonna, you know, come into play some way somehow. I thought it was gonna be Montrose turning into Tick and you know sacrificing himself instead. But damn, Ruby, Christina. Come on, man, not like this. Just then, Christina's followers begin to surround Montrose, Hippolyta, and Gia, and everyone begins to attack. Ruby and Christina also start to get it on. Yo, <laughs> Mortal Kombat! Yo, this was like Royal Rumble. Everybody was getting in there. People was getting shots. You knew Hippolyta was out here getting her warrior princess on because, you know, she already had that combat training. Montrose was getting a couple good licks in. I think Gia kicked somebody. I don't know why she didn't whip out them nine tails and start sucking people's faces off. Cool, but did you see that fight with Letty and Ruby? Oh, my goodness. Ruby was out here like dink, 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 like right there in her face in there. I'm like, yo, yo, lay off of Letty's face now, you know, and then she going to body slam her and everything. I'm like, man, this is a true slobber knocker. Like we going WWE for real. As the battle rages on, Christina is getting the best of Letty and throws her out of a window. I had to pause the video right there. My heart sunk when I saw Letty flying out the window to then fall and you heard the cook. I was like, oh, I mean, I wanted to go up to Letty like Simba did to Mufasa and be like, yo, get up. Yo, Letty, get up. We see Diana reading the Lovecraft Country book that Tick got from the future. She hears some noises outside of the car and is terrified to discover that the Shagas are running around outside the car. Right before they make their way to the car, the black Shagoth jumps in front to save the day. Let's go Shaft, coming in and saving the day right in the nick of time again. He's a complicated Shagoth, but nobody understands him but Diana. Christina has returned from her fight with Letty and she now has the Book of Names in her possession. Hippolyta and Gia have both been captured and someone read Montrose a really good bedtime story. Christina begins the ritual by slicing Tick's arms and she also begins to bathe in his blood. As this ceremony continues, energy flows through Tick pouring into Christina. At the same time, Letty wakes up from her fatal fall. Turns out Letty now has the mark of Cain. Letty shoots up and runs faster than Forrest Gump only to see Tick on the altar dying. She tells him that she loves him and with a fading smile, Tick dies. You know what? At this point in the story, I'm like... I, I'm just, I just got a mix of emotions, you know, like I'm mad, but I'm also sad. And I'm also still trying to like hold out hope that there's just going to be some type of way to save Tick. And from the looks of it, Gia's vision of Tick's future and his death has actually come true. So now I got to go in the next step of grief, which is a cold plate of revenge. Letty stabs Christina from behind and begins to recite the incantation of Hannah's binding spell. 
Christina laughs because she's immortal at this point. She tells Letty to give it up because the potion that she gave to them under the guise of being Ruby never had her blood in it to begin with. Gia now realizes that it's her time to shine as she recalls the shaman's prophecy. She steps into the dark funnel cloud and two of her foxtails immediately connect to Tick and Christina. So let me explain the shaman's prophecy real quick and how it actually came true. The shaman said that you have not even become one with the darkness yet. Well, we can see Jiha do that the moment she steps into the black funnel cloud that Letty conjured up. She also said you will see countless deaths before your journey is done. As we do know about Jia's powers, when her tails connect with people, she's able to see their entire lives. So I'm assuming here that the countless deaths that the shaman referred to will be a combination of the people Tick, Christina, and Titus have all killed. And let's not forget, Titus was a whole colonizer, and he did kill all those Native Americans. So that, I believe, fulfills the prophecy of the shaman for Gia. With Gia's help to connect the bodies of Tick, Titus, and Christina, Letty continues the binding spell. Because of Gia's powers, we begin to see flashbacks including Tick's baptism, Christina catching Ruby trying to steal the blood potion, and Ruby's death, Tick's passing down the Black Shagoth to D. Tick giving a letter to Hippolyta for his fake daddy Montrose, Christina and Ruby's body placing the mark of Cain on the fallen body of Letty, and Tick embracing Montrose in what appears to be them burying the hatchet. Okay, so let's kind of go over the flashbacks here. If you think about the image of Tick's baptism, Gia saw this as Tick's future the first time she started to absorb him, and now that same image of the baptism is now part of Tick's past. Now, when it comes to Christina catching Ruby, I gotta say, I felt some type of way about this. I don't know, like, I don't, I don't like the fact that Ruby just died off screen like that. You know, I've, man, just justice for Ruby or something. I mean, I love the twist and everything with uh, Christina being Ruby and all that. So I understand why they shot it the way they did, but I still, I just wanted a little bit more for Ruby. I love seeing Tick pass down Shaft to D. In the previous episodes, Tick did say that he wanted to learn magic to protect his entire family. So giving Diana her own protector, I thought was really dope. And when it came to Christina saving Letty, I think all of that was really just Christina honoring Ruby's dying wish. Ruby did ask Christina not to hurt Letty. And I really think this just continues to add to the ambiguity of Christina's character as the show's antagonist or villain. I mean, one minute she's protecting Letty twice with the invulnerability spell. Then she's also helping Diana. She's helping Tick. And then you're out here killing Ruby. I mean, yeah, Christina is foul for killing Ruby, but I think she also loved her very much too. I think it's just the case that Christina just so happens to place her goals of becoming immortal above everything and everyone else. Lastly, I love the fact that Tick was able to forgive Montrose. Even though Tick did have a front row seat to witness all of the trauma Montrose faced growing up, it's still not that easy to just grow up and forgive your physical abuser, even if it is your parent. We go back to the present to find Christina now buried under a pile of rubble. She's trying to cast what may be the invulnerability spell, but it isn't working. She realizes that she's been bound from using magic. However, Letty comes in to say that it's not just Christina that's been bound from magic, but all white people around the world, and that the magic is now theirs. Montrose woke up from his nap to find that Tick is dead on the altar. He remains in disbelief that Tick won't get up. Hippolyta then gives him the letter from Tick. It begins with Tick quoting from one of his favorite books, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Tick pleads to Montrose to find supreme happiness, to teach his son new ways of living, and to stop repeating the mistakes of the past, thus giving Montrose a second chance at being a better father. The family then carries Tick's body home. Wow. That spell, whoo, that was, you bound all white people around the world from being able to use magic? What do y'all have against Harry Potter? But when I really think about what they did with this spell and where it came from, it's really starting to like blow my mind, right? So check this out. This was a spell from Hannah, a runaway slave, a woman who was abused and raped, no less. With all the magic power in the world at her fingertips in the Book of Names, she created a spell to take away magic from white people. I mean, this woman could have made any number of spells far worse, far more vengeful. She could have wiped all white people from the planet or 
maybe even make them all slaves or something. I don't know. But what she ended up doing was just taking away some of their power. Recall that in this Lovecraft world, being white held significant social status, but you would be of an even higher status if you were white and had magic. I don't know, maybe the power of racism was too strong even for magic or something, but one thing I do know, the white people in this Lovecraft country world are lucky. Hannah could have gone full Django on all of them, and I don't know if anybody would really blame her. All this just kind of reminded me of the quote from Kimberly Jones who said, You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us. When we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. And when you take an honest look at history over time, Um, that's actually been the case predominantly for black people for centuries. I mean, when I was in grad school, I read stories and narratives from enslaved African Americans, and I have to say it blew me away. It really changed my mind, especially given the fact that, you know, I had to go to grad school just to be exposed to it. But what blew my mind was that I was reading narratives from enslaved African Americans from like 300 plus years ago or whatever. And in the narratives, they were saying the same stuff that we have been talking about to this very day. And I know some of you like to have, you know, like little tidbits to research and stuff like that. And I won't go into like a long explanation about it, but I will give you something a little interesting to look up and research on your own. I want you to check out David Walker's appeal of 1829. He wasn't an enslaved African-American, but his appeal was one of the very first and more significant condemnations of slavery that also further inspired the anti-slavery movement. And the one thing I want you to do when you read it is just see how crazy this is. This thing was written in 1829, and it literally sounds like something that was written today. Anyway, another thing I really enjoyed about this ending was uh, Tick's plea to Montrose to break, like, you know, this generational cycle of abuse. I mean, the thing that really sucks here, especially for black Americans in in America, is that we've suffered so much historically That we've never really had a beneficial way to process a lot of that trauma. So a lot of that pain that great grandma, great granddaddy felt, now go to grandma, now go to mom, now come down to you or me or whoever. It gets passed down to the generations and unprocessed trauma can manifest itself in various forms of abuse or different vices to try and numb the pain. I mean, look, in the black community, unfortunately, there's a stigma against seeking therapy. So Tick's recognition of the need to break that emotional cycle of pain, I think is profound and desperately needed for the next generation to go on. So you all tell me, what did you think about the full impact of Hannah's spell once you found out that it actually binds all white people from using magic? We return back to find Christina still crying for help, that is, until Diana and the Black Shoggoth come riding through. Diana says that Christina still hasn't learned and reveals her new robotic arm. Diana places her robotic hand around Christina's neck and makes her say night-night for good. Wow. So, Dee's a whole murderer now? She's gonna get another pass for this one, too. But I'll be honest, look, um, I thought Diana was, like, the very last person... Um, that I would have ever thought to be the one to kill Christina. I mean, when her and Shaft showed up, I kind of thought that D was going to let Shaft do all the dirty work and have himself a late night snack. I mean, what do you think about Diana now being a murderer? Do you think that this was like a natural progression in her character? And I'm not saying that Christina didn't deserve to, you know, get some sort of justice, but I'm just really wondering about whether Diana was the right person to actually do it. Now, on a separate note, I really would not mind seeing a spinoff series for Diana. I mean, at this point, we know that she is the hooded woman with the robotic arm that eventually meets Tick. Plus, she's got a multiverse hopping mom to teach her all this scientific stuff. And she's got Letty who can teach her magic too. I mean, come on now, think about it. The wild adventures of Diana and Shaft. I love it. 
Well, folks, we have finally made it to the end of the road here. You know, I gotta say, I'm still kind of mixed on Tick's ending and all that. But I gotta say, when I was thinking about his arc within this episode, it reminded me of how this show still likes to borrow storytelling from Christianity. I thought there were a number of different scenes in this, you know, episode alone that really mirrored the story of Christ. It first struck me when I saw Tick reuniting with his mom, Dora. And she was comforting him because he knew that he was going to have to die for a greater cause. That reminded me of the biblical passage of when Jesus was praying before his crucifixion. And he prayed asking if it would be within God's will to take this burden away from him. And then an angel came to strengthen and comfort Jesus. So I thought Tick in this sense was Jesus and Dora was just like the angel. Then you had the other scene where Christina came in to talk to Tick. That reminded me of when the devil tried to tempt Jesus in the desert. Christina offered Tick a tempting option as a way out of his sacrifice by just handing over the book of names, or in other words, by handing over his power. And in a similar way, the devil offered Jesus a number of easy ways out of his own sacrifice in exchange for power too, in a sense. Then of course, the final scene with Tick's death at the altar in a similar position that Christ also died during the crucifixion. You had Gia and Hippolyta looking on, watching Tick die the same way Jesus' disciples were probably watching him die too. Anyway, that's just my take on it. Maybe that was the intention of the writers. Maybe I've taken one too many religious studies courses in grad school. I don't know. Either way, what did you think about the ending? Do you have a different interpretation of the events that occurred? As far as like where this show is going, I think it could probably end right here, kind of like how Watchmen did as a limited series. But at the same time, I think it could go to a season two. I'm just kind of curious as to like what direction they will go in. Um, They might just have to like make stuff up. But hey, like I said, I mean, I'd be down for a story about Diana. Matter of fact, I'd also be down if we had a story like maybe a time jump in the future. And maybe we follow what happens to young George Freeman, you know, Tick's son. And hey, he's got a cool mom with Letty. You know, he's got some other cool family members and everything. I think that'd be kind of interesting too. Maybe there's a brand new threat out there that requires the family to use their magic powers. Maybe Tick does a guest appearance as a ghost or something. Anything can happen. As always, please leave your thoughts down below in the comments. I know there are a ton of things to talk about and I want to hear what you have to say. And look, let me just say that this has been nothing short of a fun ride and I cannot begin to tell you how much I sincerely appreciate you taking the time to watch my video and a special shout out to those of you that are actually sharing my video with your friends. That really does mean a lot to me for real and it supports my channel. So you know, if there is a season two, you better believe I will be covering it. And I hope to see you come back and join me if that happens. If you're new here and you like what you see, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and make sure you hit that bell so you don't miss out the next time I drop a video. Whew, man, now with this done, uh, I think I'm going to go catch up on some shows that have been sitting in my queue since forever. So you tell me, what do you plan on watching now that Lovecraft Country is done? Personally, I think I'm going to finally catch up on uh, Umbrella Academy or whatever it is. I, it looks pretty good, so I think I'm going to go check that out. Anyway, I've got more videos and reviews to do for you all. And until next time, I'll see you all later.